so hello everybody thank you for, for joining us on a, a hot wednesday evening um for those who don't know her i'd like to introduce you to uh, dr elizabeth drayson um, she became a fellow of the college in uh, 1999 and um, she specializes in medieval and early modern spanish literature and cultural history and has a particular interest in the Arabic, Jewish and Christian cultures of medieval and the Golden Age Spain, as well as the relationship between medieval literature, art and film. She retired last year and is now an Emeritus Fellow of the College. She's just published a new book called Lost Paradise, the story of Granada, but this evening she'll be talking to us about her book, The Moor's Last Stand, how seven centuries of Muslim rule in Spain came to an end. So Liz, over to you. Do tell us, <laughs> perhaps you'd start by telling us what led you to the research for this book. Oh, yes. Okay, before I start, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> what led me to it really was, um, I suppose, everything that I'd done before. I'd written a couple of books, one on um, the legend of, of the, in, the Moorish invasion of Spain um, in 711, and I'd um, written a book about the Moriscos in the 16th century. And um, it seemed a logical uh, next step, really, to, um, to look at what happened at the end of Muslim rule in Spain. And um, I also wanted to present um, that history from the point of view of um, the losers. Normally, it's been presented traditionally from the point of view of the Christian conquerors. So I wanted to, to look at it from the other side of the coin. Okay, that's lovely. And <laughs> we look forward to hearing from you about about uh, the book. Okay, so um, I'm going to share my screen then, um, Jane. Okay. So, is that okay? Can everyone see that now? Yeah. Yes, I okay? believe so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm just. I'm just fiddling around with my papers here, which seem to be flopping about rather than standing up properly like they should be. Um, okay, so, well, good evening, everyone. And um, I echo Jane in, in thanking you for coming, especially on such a hot England here, uh, evening here in England. Um, and many thanks to Jane for kindly inviting me to talk about my book, The Moor's Last Stand. So some of you may have heard uh, of the legend of the Moor's last sigh, rather than his last stand. And in that legend, Spain's Sultan weeps as he looks back on Granada, the city he ruled and lost, yet is cruelly reproached by his mother for crying like a woman for what he couldn't defend like a man. And his last sigh is the subject of this striking um, 19th century painting by Francisco Pradilla. So that Sultan is the protagonist of my book, a man despised in the past as a coward, a traitor or pitied as a tragic victim <clears throat> and largely ignored by history. And um, as I was just saying, I wanted to tell his story for two reasons. Uh, first, because there was no previous full history of his life and times in either English or Spanish. Um, and second, because my aim was to view his life from, from a different perspective, using contemporary and later sources to show that rather than a betrayer or a coward, he was instead a courageous man whose life was of the utmost importance to the history of Spain and also of Europe. To demonstrate that, I'm going to discuss three key questions. First, who exactly was the Moor in the book title? Second, what led to his surrender and to the end of Muslim rule in Spain? And third, what was his last stand and why is it important? So first, first of all then, I'll answer the question of the Moor's identity. Oh. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. So I should be on this slide now. Okay, back to screen sharing, I hope. Oh. Let's try that again. There we are. OK, so this anonymous portrait painted in the late 15th century is the only existing image of the last Moorish Sultan in Spain. Abu Abdullah Mohammed ben Ali, or Mohammed XI, 
known as Boabdil to the Christians, ruled the Islamic Emirate of Granada in southern Spain from 1482 to 1492 as head of the Nazareth dynasty of Muslim rulers in Spain. From inexperienced youth, he rose to become a powerful ruler at a crossroads in Spanish history, a fascinating paradoxical figure at the heart of a major regime change whose life has come, become legend, yet also deeply resonant with, I think, with some of our own contemporary concerns. In that final momentous year of his reign, 1492, three events took place with far reaching repercussions on Spanish, European, and also world history. Firstly, in August, 1492, Christopher Columbus set sail from Palos de la Frontera, 80 miles from Seville, on his first voyage of discovery of the Americas. Then, earlier the same year, in April, an edict had been issued ordering the permanent expulsion of all Jews from the kingdoms of Spain by the end of July. So this painting, uh, also by Previlla, uh, depicts the first major event of the year, which occurred on the 2nd of January in the city of Granada, when Sultan Boabdil handed over the keys of his city to the Christian monarchs, King Ferdinand and his Queen Isabella, marking a watershed in a centuries old clash between two great religions and cultures. It symbolized the epoch changing transition of the Kingdom of Granada from an Islamic state to a Christian territory, a moment which set Spain on course to become the greatest power in early modern Europe. To understand how this crucial turning point in Spanish and European history came about, we need to see Boabdil's life in the context of a conflict between Christians and Muslims in medieval Spain that had begun nearly eight centuries earlier. We must go back as far as the year 711 AD to the time when Islam began in Spain and consider how it waxed and waned and how it fended off the rising power of a Christian reconquest. The roots of the conflict that led to the fateful day on, in January 1492, lay in the Muslim invasion of Visigothic Spain, which was at, time, at that time Christian. King Roderick, um, shown here in an engraving from the 17th century, was the last monarch of the Spanish Visigoths, who ruled for barely two years before losing his kingdom when his army was defeated by a Moorish raiding party in July 711 at the Battle of Guadalete in Southern Andalusia depicted here by uh, another Spanish 19th century painter, Cubels. The reigns of Roderick and Boabdil mark the beginning and end of Islamic rule in Spain. And like Boabdil, Roderick's life became part of fiction and myth. He was the king on whose watch the Iberian Peninsula was conquered by Arab and Berber tribes from North Africa, led by Tariq ibn Ziyad, after whom the Rock of Gibraltar is named. And from that time on, there would be a continuous Arab presence in Spain for over seven centuries. The tales of invasion and conquest involving first Roderick and then Boabdil have gained importance in the context of present day religious um, tensions between Islam and the West. We can recognize, sorry, I seem to have, okay. We can recognize the crucial role of Spain in the Middle Ages as the meeting point of Europe and the Orient, of Christianity and Islam, set against the negative medieval perception of Islam by Christians and of Christianity by Muslims. In the first 300 years after 711, Muslim power grew strong. Muslim armies rapidly conquered all of Spain except the Northern Kingdom of Asturias and crossed the Pyrenees into what is now southern France in pursuit of the Jihad. They were defeated in 732 by Charlemagne's grandfather, Charles Martel, at the Battle of Poitiers, which ended both their expansion north and the prospect of what would have been a very different Europe under Muslim rule. So this uh, map shows um, the area in green, which was all uh, Muslim territory in, in the Iberian Peninsula up to the north um, which is uh, Asturias and then France further, further above that. 
So in that year, in 756, indicated in this map, um, the first emirate was founded when a young Muslim nobleman from Damascus, Abd al-Rahman, fled to Spain to escape the massacre of his family by a rival dynasty and proclaimed himself emir with his capital at Cordoba, which you can see more or less in the middle, bottom middle of the map, underlined as Cordoba with a K. His reign was the start of the golden age of Spanish Islam, when schools were built, the construction of the great mosque was begun, which we can see here in all its glory, literature flourished and a famous law school was established. Cordoba rightly earned the accolade ornament of the world as the German nun Rotz Wither described it in the 10th century. But the glory of Cordoba was short lived and the emirate declined rapidly mainly because its power became too centralized and it finally collapsed in 1031. So on the next slide, I've done a little summary here. Um, of course, what I'm going to say next is, is quite detailed. Um, so if you just follow the, the circles round in a clockwise direction, I hope it will help. Muslim Spain, known as Al-Andalus, broke up into 20 small states called Taifa kingdoms each ruled by its own emir. Internal squabbles and conflicts left them vulnerable, while two powerful religious enemies were gathering to the north and the south. In the north, the Christian desire to regain what they saw as their native land developed into a so-called reconquest, a crusade encouraged by the Pope to win back the territories perceived as lost to Islam after 711. And if we look at the map on the left, which is, um, uh, shows the time of the Cid, Spain's great hero, um, in the late 11th century. We can see all the orange parts of the map um, were reconquered Christ Christian territories by that time. In the south, a threat from North Africa was looming. In the late 11th century, the Muslims of Al-Andalus were overrun, first by an army of religious zealots and reformers from the North African coast, the Berber dynasty of the Almoravids. Shortly after, the Almohads, another Berber dynasty of intolerant anti-secular extremists, captured most of the cities of Al-Andalus by 1172. But in 1212, they were decisively defeated by a Christian army at a famous battle at Las Navas de Tolosa near Jaén, which is not far from Granada. Troops from Castile and Aragon swept southwards, and by 1248, Al-Andalus had lost most of its major cities, including Cordoba and Seville, to the Christians. Spain's history had reached a crucial moment. Muslim power was waning, and the progress of the Christ Christian reconquest seemed unstoppable. Yet, just when Islamic life in the Spanish peninsula faltered, a new Muslim dynasty was founded in the small town of Arjona near Jaén. There, a local chief named Muhammad ibn Nasr ibn al-Ahmar of the Red proclaimed himself emir. And just five years later, in 1237, the city of Granada became his capital. The Nazarid dynasty was born, its identity taken from the new chief's resonant name of Nasr, meaning victory. Taking the title of Muhammad I, he created a dynastic line which ruled for over 250 years until the day in 1492 when Boabdil relinquished his city. So the scene is set for my second question. What finally led to the end of Muslim rule in Spain and to Boabdil's surrender? And the answer lies in both clan and religious conflict. Like the Taifa kingdoms before, clan conflict bedeviled the history of the Nazarid dynasty, beset by antagonism, betrayal, and murder, all of which had a direct bearing upon Boabdil's reign and set the tone for the climactic events leading up to the fall of Granada. From its foundation in 1237 to that time, the kingdom of Granada had developed into a state with many of the characteristics of a modern European nation. The living side by side of three religious communities known as convivencia, which was such an important feature of Islamic Spain in earlier centuries, was completely absent 
from the Kingdom of Granada until 1492. Their society was bonded not by a tribe, but by a single religion, Islam, by a single universal language, Arabic, and by a sense of the deep differences between the Granadan people and the other beyond its frontier, a people who spoke a Romance language, Castilian, and who also had a single religion, Christianity. That might be a scene that's familiar to, to some of you, the Alhambra Palace. So amid this climate of discord and brutality, Boabdil was born in the Alhambra sometime between 1459 and 1462 under the rule of his grandfather, Saad. Boabdil's life had two important aspects that reflect the perils of clan and religious conflict. First, his relationship with his family, uh, and second, his interaction with the Christians. No source tells us the details of Boabdil's early years, but using later, mostly Christian historical accounts, we know that he grew up in this great palace and fortress and was given an Islamic education at the Madrasa inside the Alhambra city and became a skilled hunter, horseman and fighter. One night in 1464, Boabdil's grandfather Saad was overthrown by his own son, Abu Hassan, Boabdil's father, who had a warlike, cruel nature and a weakness for sensual indulgence. Abu Hassan favoured fighting over diplomacy and is said to have refused to pay tribute to the Castilian queen Isabella because, he claimed, the places in Granada where coins were minted were forging lance heads to make war. His lustful nature had far-reaching consequences for his son and heir, Boabdil. Abul Hassan's legitimate wife, Aisha, was an important and powerful Nazarid princess, said to have been descended in a direct line from the Prophet Muhammad. And Boabdil was the eldest of their three children. Things went well in their marriage until another woman came into Abul Hassan's life. Enchanted by the beauty of a young Christian captive, Isabel de Solis, known as Zoraya, he took her as his queen and never had anything more to do with Aisha. Abul Hassan and Soraya's two young sons, Saad and Nasser, posed a severe threat to Boabdil's legitimate succession to the Nazareth throne. But his mother had a very important card up her sleeve. Determined that her eldest son should inherit the emirate, as a Nazareth princess, she could transmit rights to the throne, rights which she exercised as mother of the next legitimate Nazareth sultan. In 1482, amid these family crises, Boabdil married Moraima, the daughter of the governor of a nearby town, and soon they had a daughter, Aisha, and later two sons, Ahmed and Yusuf. The future Moorish Sultan lived with his new family, as well as his brother, sister and mother, in the close-knit community of the Alhambra, in the Court of the Lions, under the shadow of his father's licentious lifestyle and increasingly severe rule. By mid-July 1482, things reached a tipping point and a new drama was set to be played out on the political stage of Granada. In mortal danger from their impetuous father, Boabdil and his brother Yusuf fled from the Alhambra sometime early in 1482. And this is a photo of their alleged escape route out of that window. Um, and they seem to have abseiled down uh, the walls of the Alhambra using knotted sheets. So their supporters conceived a dramatic plot to oust Abu Hassan and replace him with his son. Taking advantage of Abu Hassan's absence from the Alhambra while he was away fighting, yeah. Boabdil and his entourage entered Granada where he was proclaimed Sultan Muhammad XI on the 15th of July, 1482 adopting the honorary title Conqueror by the Grace of God, <clears throat> one of the Nazareth mottos inscribed on the walls throughout the Alhambra, which we can see here on uh, the Nazareth shield. Now, the threat of religious conflict beyond the frontier came to the fore, and Boabdil had to confront growing pressure from the formidable army of the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand II of Aragon 
and Isabella I of Castile. As they saw it, the Kingdom of Granada was the final bastion of Islam, whose reconquest would lead to the end of the 700 year Muslim presence in the peninsula. So this map uh, shows us in green, uh, the Emirate, the Nazareth Emirate of Granada, as it was in 1482. In the next year, 1483, Boabdil took his army far into Christian territory to Luthena to avenge the burning of his crops by Ferdinand. And you can see Luthena, if you look at the blue area of the map, um, to the left, it's marked with a blue dot. And Granada has a white dot in the center. So you can see it was quite a long way uh, away. Uh, and there Boabdil's soldiers were tricked into thinking they were up against a large Christian army and they fled across a stream where Boabdil's horse sank in the mud and the Sultan was captured and imprisoned in the castle at Porcuna to await Ferdinand's pleasure. I think what is interesting um, is that these are the actual clothes worn by Boabdil at the Battle of Lucena and we can see his, his jacket and marlotta and boots and his Nazareth sword, Damascene sword and scabbard, um, which are now kept in the army museum in Madrid. Eventually, <clears throat> Boabdil was released, but under severe conditions, which included taking his tiny son Ahmed as hostage. The Sultan was obliged to become the vassal of the Catholic kings, obey their orders and come whenever they called him. He was in a bind. Forced to comply with the wishes of Ferdinand and Isabella, who'd taken his son hostage, he inevitably aroused the hostility of the Granadan people, who saw him as a betrayer. Over the next five years, his fortunes fluctuated as he was put in ever more compromising situations by the Christians, and their yearly campaigns of attack left him and his people isolated in Granada, which became a city desperately fighting for survival. Despite his refusal to relinquish power, <clears throat> by 1491, the writing was on the wall. Granada lived in fear and hardship, while frantic secret negotiations went on behind the scenes. <clears throat> Excuse me. By November, the conditions had worsened due to food shortages, and it was clear that the enemy hoped to wear the Granadans down by starvation. The contemporary historian, Hernando de Baeza, described the heart-rending sight of women with babies in their arms, begging in the streets for food. Desperate people gathered in gangs, shouting that the Sultan must get help from the Christians, and if they, he wouldn't, they would. The end was in sight for Islamic rule in Spain. Boabdil used all the diplomatic means in his power to secure the best possible terms for Granada and for his family. The terms of surrender in which Boabdil sought to preserve the religious life and customs of his people were signed by the Sultan, by Ferdinand and by Isabella on the 25th of November 1491. And this is a photograph of the original document uh, <clears throat> called, known as the Capitulations. The official surrender of Granada has captured the imagination of writers and artists up to the present, initially as a moment of supreme conquest and later because of the extreme poignancy of that day of transition and loss. The ill-fated Sultan left the city he loved for the last time and his journey gave rise to that legend of the Moors' last sigh. Boabdil and his family lived in internal exile in a country estate 100 kilometers from Granada for a short time, but the death of his wife soon after and strong pressure from the Christians to leave prompted him to abandon Spain. By October 1493, he'd sailed for North Africa. Mystery surrounds the place and date of his death. Some records suggest he may have died in Fez not long after he'd left Spain, while there's a counterclaim that he died in the city of Clomsen in modern day Algeria. So it was that Boabdil surrendered Granada to Christian Spain, which marked the end of seven centuries of Muslim rule. So this leads to my final question. What was Boabdil's last stand and why is it important? 
Well, to answer this, I must return to the Moor's last sigh and his mother's rebuke, which became an ironic point of reference and began to mould his portrait as a man too weak and cowardly to die for his religion, aided and abetted by a very popular historical novel called The Granadan Civil Wars, published in 1595, which blackened his name by accusing him of the appalling massacre of the rival Abenceraje clan, actually carried out by his grandfather. The dramatic portrayal um, or the dramatic potential of Boabdil's fictional portrayal as either a cowardly or even malevolent ruler or as a tragic victim was harnessed by early modern playwrights, including the great 16th century Spanish dramatist Lope de Vega, as they played out the triumph of Christian conquest and imperialism on the stage. A century later, in 1672, John Dryden's play, The Conquest of Granada, presents a lovelorn Boabdil who dies tragically in a work which maps that conquest onto contemporary political events in England, using Boabdil's sorry plight as a warning against civil discord. In the 300 years after Boabdil's surrender, at the expense of his reputation, fiction writers, dramatists and opera composers, major and minor, return to the scene of surrender to retell the tale of victory while implicitly querying its meaning. Poised between fact and fiction, Boabdil evolved into a romantic figure in the 19th century. His personal drama of monarchy and treachery, heroism and invasion encapsulated the spirit of that age and chimed with the vogue for all things oriental. The French writer Chateaubriand's sympathy for Boabdil's legendary tears began to change the focus to nostalgia and the pain of exile suffered by the Sultan as a tragic victim. Then, for the first time, Boabdil found a defender in the American writer Washington Irving, who challenged the demonizing legend and pointed out the injustices of the views of posterity up to that time. Irving's vindication of Bo Boabdil was so influential that the Sultan became a figure of importance for black Americans, especially in popular art, symbolizing black power and chivalry. From the mid 20th century, Boabdil came into his own as a symbol of political resistance. Several important novels written in Spain and England during the last 30 years have refuted the accusations of history and set Boabdil in the spotlight as a man whose life has meaning for our modern world. One of these is Salman Rushdie's The Moor's Last Sigh. Fascinated by Boabdil's predicament, Rushdie depicts 1940s Bombay as a city destroyed by fanaticism and imperialism and corruption like Granada. Contemporary Arab writers and artists have also found a rich source of inspiration in Boabdil as a kindred spirit who is the embodiment of exile set against Granada as the site of their own nostalgia for their homeland. So, the idea of a last stand now seems more appropriate than a last sigh. Boabdil has become important to us today as a potent symbol of the forces of rebellion and an unconventional yet modern hero in his own right. A man of culture and of war, a man of destiny with the die cast for the fate of Granada long before he came to power, he was a king, yet also for a time, the pawn of the Catholic monarchs. Those histories written in his lifetime or soon after present Boabdil as a brave, intelligent man leading his diminished band against an unbeatable enemy with the odds stacked overwhelmingly against him. And it's an image that flies in faith, the face of the judgments of later conventional history and it rewrites Boabdil's reputation. That reputation now hinges on the vexed issue of how Spain's medieval legacy continues to be perceived, a case in point being festival in Granada celebrating the moment of Boabdil's surrender and the capture of their city by Ferdinand and Isabella, known as the Fiesta de la Toma, held every 2nd of January. Each year, civic dignitaries reenact the Christian victory, hoisting the royal standard and Ferdinand's sword to the strains of the national anthem. 
Since the 1990s, the fiesta has been opposed by left-wing intellectuals and artists, including Yehudi Menuhin and Amin Malouf, on the grounds that it is xenophobic and inappropriate. The fiesta seems to reinforce the Christian status of the city, but the repeated reenactment of Christian victory over Muslim counterparts, and in particular of their triumph in Granada, suggests an underlying insecurity over the racial and religious issues at the heart of Spain's cultural history. Boabdil is at once the invading other and the conquered enemy, the feared yet admired Muslim presence who epitomizes the conflicted nature of Spain's relationship with its past and embodies the enduring quandary over Spain's cultural distinctiveness. Boabdil is the scapegoat who takes the full brunt of the historical act of revenge of the Christian reconquest. In almost exactly the same place in Granada where Boabdil handed the keys of the city to King Ferdinand, a pair of life-size bronze statues stand in a flower bed in a small graveled park surrounded by blocks of flats. It's well off the beaten tourist track, close to a large modern conference centre, and bears no indication of who the statues represent. So this out of the way location and understated tribute belies the historical importance of their subject. Among roses and pomegranate trees, Boabdil wearing a turban sits on a throne looking down sadly at a young woman, her head lowered in humility as she offers him a rose. This poignant monument sculpted by the Madrid artist Juan Moreno Aguado was unveiled on the 2nd of January, 1997 as a memorial to the last Moorish Sultan in Spain. The woman represents Granada, who offers Boabdil a rose as a symbol of love and in hope of forgiveness. Its message of reconciliation marks a special moment in the development of the perception of Boabdil. His last stand was a personal battle to defend his right to rule his kingdom as its legitimate Sultan. It was also a last stand against religious intolerance, fanatical power and cultural misunderstanding in which issues of violence, tension and prejudice between Muslims and Christians were as pressing then as they are now. The life and legend of Boabdil exposes how what was gained by the Christian conquest of Granada, which heralded the new nation state and the rise of Spanish imperialism, may well have been outweighed by the defeat of Muslim civilization in Spain with all its consequences for the future of relations between the Islamic states and the West. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, uh, Liz, that was, that was great, that was fascinating. Um, can I ask anyone who's got questions for Liz to submit them via the, um, the chat and uh, we'll try to um, bring, I'll, I'll amalgamate them and bring them to Liz. Um, one thing I wanted to ask Liz is I visited um, Granada some years ago. If I were to go back again, what should I look out for as part of this, this history? What marks are there left now? Well, that's a good question, um, Jane. I, well, I suppose the most obvious thing to say is, is, is to visit the Alhambra Palace because uh, that was the great iconic symbol of Muslim <clears throat> power and Muslim civilization in Spain, and, and it still is. Um, also, I would say to visit the statue of Boabdil um, being handed a rose, which is an important um, part of that. Um, and I think another aspect which perhaps is a bit uh, um, slightly, slightly tangential to this particular subject, but also important as a result of what happened in 1492, is to visit the Abbey of the Sacramonte, which was built um, uh, to house some lead books which were discovered um, on the hillside in Granada in the late 16th century, um, which turned out to be archaeological forgeries by the Moriscos of Granada at that time, who were converted, uh, Muslims converted to Christianity, um, who on the eve of being expelled from Spain completely in 1609, um, were trying to um, concoct uh, uh, through these lead texts, um, a kind of justification for, for 
uh, remaining in Spain and not being expelled. And that, that was really a direct result of, um, of the fall of Granada and, and the fact that it became a Christian state. Um, I think other things, important things to see are um, the manifestations of Granada, what Granada became, which is a Christian Catholic city. Uh, so to visit the cathedral, um, which houses the tombs of Ferdinand and Isabella. That's where they wanted to be buried, which is in a way slightly ironic because they are forever associated with, with what was a Muslim city. Um, so, um, so what they were trying to overcome has been linked with them now uh, forevermore, I suppose. Um, yeah, I think those would be the main things to, to, to look out for. Mm, okay, thank you. I will, well, if I ever get to travel again, I would very much <laughs> like to go back there. Uh, it's a very beautiful well, city. Um, so now you're retired, um, how have you been using your time then, Liz? Um, well, um, a lot of my time has been taken up with, with writing and um, getting my next book ready for press, which, which you mentioned kindly at the beginning, which is a book on the history of Granada from prehistory to the present. So that's taken um, a very great deal of my time, not least because it has uh, about 90 images in it. It's very richly illustrated. And um, it was it was a colossal task of collaboration between me and, and the editors to, to actually choose, get permissions for um, um, all those images and, and to get them of the right resolution and so on. So, so an awful, I've, I was doing that really right up to um, the beginning of June. Um, and also I've, I've been fortunate enough to be asked to give a lot of talks um, about the Moore's Last Stand and uh, about Granada too. So I've, I've, given, I've given talks in, in, in the US uh, on Zoom, of course, um, and in a number of other places. So that's, that's also taken up my time. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from the audience, from Joe Eddings, who says, um, you said Boabdil went into exile shortly after La Toma. Um, how were the remaining Muslims in Granada treated? Were they hounded out or were their religious tolerance, was, was their religious tolerance allowed, to allow them to stay? Yes, thank you, Joe. That's, that's a very good question. Um, well, in, in the terms of surrender, the Catholic monarchs had agreed um, that all Muslims remaining in Granada should be allowed to uh, continue to follow their religion, to follow Islam uh, for posterity, for, for, the, for the duration, forever. Um, and that was what Boabdil signed up to. Um, but sadly, within, well, about five years, um, they reneged on that. Um, their excuse being um, that um, there was a rebellion of um, of some of the Muslims in Granada, precisely because they they were being restricted in their religious um, practices um, and were not being allowed to do certain things, being were prohibited to have dances and and communal gatherings and so on. Um, so on on a, a very dubious um, basis, really, uh, the Catholic monarchs decided on a um, a very, shall we say, stringent policy of conversion of all remaining uh, Muslims in Granada. Um, and one of the saddest things about that was in, in the decade after the surrender in 1492, um, Cardinal Cisneros, who was the Inquisitor General, uh, organized an enormous book burning in uh, the, one of the squares in Granada, the Biberambla Square. Um, in which um, untold numbers of, of priceless Arabic texts were all burnt um, and only a few were saved uh, and hidden. Um, so, so basically the situation gradually got worse and worse um, over the next century in fact and, and as I uh, briefly said just now um, it ended finally in the expulsion of all uh, Muslims who would not convert to Christianity and, and a lot of those who, who had converted, starting in the year 1609. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are any more questions, where would people like to submit them now? Um, otherwise, I think um, we may draw this session to a close. Thank you very much, then, uh, Liz. It's been, it's been very enlightening. Um, we have taken a recording of this, so we will make this available to some of the few people. I've had a couple of emails from people saying, I'm sorry, I can't make it at the last minute. So we'll be able to share it with them. 
But okay. thank you, thank you for joining us this evening. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I, I hope it was interesting. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.